All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the first Silicon Valley Skeptics Talk. I am, <laughs> I am very honored to introduce our speaker today, the former executive director of the National Center for Science Education, a not-for-profit organization that promotes good public science education. Uh, she is also the author of Evolution versus Creationism, an introduction, and the co-author of Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. She received the James Randi Award from the James Randi Education Foundation and nine honorary doctorates for her work at NCSE. <laughs> Please help me welcome Dr. Eugenie Scott. Sir. Good evening. And uh, isn't this a great place to have a, a meeting? This is terrific. I recommend the bathrooms. On a cold night like this, the warm toilet seat feels really, really great. <laughs> I mean, how many, you know, how many of us have warm toilet seats? You know, we're at Google, so this is a real opportunity. Well, I'm very pleased to have been invited to speak for the inaugural uh, Silicon Valley Skeptics Organization. I think the skeptics movement is a very important one. Um, science and critical thinking are maybe more important in the United States today than they have been at any other time in our history. So I encourage all of you, especially from this end of the Bay, to support Hunter and the other uh, Silicon Valley skeptics to help our movement grow. Well, I'm here to talk today about the Kitzmiller versus Dover um, trial, which hard to believe was <clears throat> 10 years ago, uh, 2005. And actually, we're coming quite close to the uh, day that the um, decision came down, which was December 20th, known affectionately at NCSE as Kitzmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, 10 years ago, a small school district in central Pennsylvania was the locus of what became an exceedingly important legal decision affecting the teaching of science in the United States. The case concerned the teaching of intelligent design, which was presented by its proponents, of course, as a legitimate science that had a place in the public school science curriculum. Now, I hope I'm not spoiling the punchline to tell you that they lost, okay? You all probably know that. But what if the decision had gone the other way? What if the um, conservative Republican church-going George W. Bush appointee judge had decided that, well, in fact, intelligent design is science. It is appropriate to teach it. It's a good critical thinking exercise, which is what its proponents uh, were, were proposing in uh, Dover, Pennsylvania. I suspect that science education in the United States would have been very different than what we see now. And um, I'll be talking a little bit about that. But let me tell you a little bit about Dover, because it's 10 years ago, so you don't remember a lot of the details, right? I didn't remember a lot of the details. <clears throat> well, 10 years ago, Kitzmiller versus Dover made quite a splash. It was, at the time, a very large news story. All of the networks and major print publications covered the case. The Daily Show even had a segment on intelligent design that was inspired by the Kitzmiller trial. And the NOVA um, produced a um, two-hour documentary called Judgment Day in 2007. It received a Peabody Award and also an award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science for scientific journalism. But even more importantly than that, Trivial Pursuit had a question that asked, what topic was banned from a Pennsylvania district science class in 2005 that violated the separation of church and state? The answer, of course, is intelligent design. And of course, the political cartoonists had a field day. Um, someday it would be lovely just to do a whole presentation about cartoons about Dover, but um, as much fun as that would be, there are other things I want to talk about, but I had to share some of them. The, the teacher is saying, today, class, we're going to discuss the scientific theory of intelligent design. God did everything. Dismissed. <laughs> 
th this one's a little more subtle, but it's really one of my favorites. Um, yes, look closely. You'll... Now, there were even a few pro-intelligent design cartoons, but I assure you there were not many. This one picks up a very common intelligent design motif uh, that supporters uh, often promote, that they are being unfairly discriminated against. So you see the poor, benighted scientists of intelligent design who are um, being ignored. Um, uh, the, the, the Darwinist establishment is, is working against them. And just this fall, a new American television program called The Grinder, about a couple of lawyers, featured a reference to Dover, much to our surprise. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Well, that could be interesting. Well, we were having some kind of fun with this. Um, ah, there we go. Kitts Miller v. Dover, 1994. The defense introduced testimony in closing arguments. Schachter v. Bloom, 1997. New evidence during deliberation. Gilpin v. Rehnquist, 2000. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, of course, uh, that first Kitts Miller v. Dover. Uh, it wasn't 1984, it was 2005. Uh, we didn't introduce any new evidence during the summary. I mean, you know, but. We were a little startled to see this little Easter egg pop up in um, a modern day television program. I, I kept trying to encourage one of my colleagues to find out who, who wrote that script. They, they could be a, a secret fan of NCSEs, we don't know. Dover first came on the radar of the National Center for Science Education in 2002, when a student painted mural about human evolution was taken out of a science classroom and burned. The four by 16 foot mural had been painted by student Zach Strasbaugh and donated to the school in 1998, but it rested on a chalkboard, unhung because the custodians refused to hang it up. School custodian Larry Reeser had apparently been stewing about the mural for several years and with his granddaughter due to enter school in the fall of 2002, during that summer, he took the mural out and burned it. Mr. Reeser, this, this is the only known picture of Larry Reeser ever, I think. You know how you go on Google, you go into images, and you're looking for pictures, and you can't find them. It drives you nuts. He attended a talk that I gave last month in York, Pennsylvania. We had a 10th year uh, celebratory anniversary for the uh, plaintiff's legal team. And I and Ken Miller uh, were asked to do some teacher workshops and give a public presentation. And Mr. Reeser showed up at our presentation and started grilling us about what the evidence, there's no evidence for evolution. And this wasn't our first rodeo. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> we kind of heard these questions before. Uh, and Ken was just brilliant. He just sort of laid out about four just really great examples of why evolution happened, right? There's the, the only possible explanation for these things. I, conf I confess we did not convince Mr. Reeser that evolution had taken place. And honest to God, at the end of, uh, yeah, finally the moderator said, Mr. You know, they did, he didn't, I, I didn't find out that this was Larry Reeser until afterwards. I'd have gotten his autograph. I mean, he's a, you know, but I didn't. But the moderator finally asked Mr the questioner to sit down and call on somebody else. But before he sat down, honest to God, he lifted up a Bible and turned to the, you know, turned to the audience and said, the answers are all here. It was the best Captain Fitzroy moment I had ever seen. <laughs> it was just great. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Reeser um, uh, was unhappy with the, um, with the mural. And as I say, his daughter uh, was about to enter school and he was not gonna put up with this. As Mr. Reader, Reeser told reporter Lori Lebo at the time of the trial in good Pennsylvania Dutch, you can see the guy Schwanz hanging out. To Reeser, the mural was both pornographic and anti-religious. School board member Bill Buckingham is quoted as having told teacher Bertha Spar that he had gleefully watched it burn with Mr. Reeser. So there was something of a history of anti-evolutionism in the town of Dover, even before it became a national story. 
And certainly this history of anti-evolutionism was quite important uh, when science textbooks, biology textbooks came up for adoption in 2004. Now the high school biology teachers wanted to get the new edition of the book they had been using, which is a very popular high school biology book, Miller and Levine's Biology. School board member Bill Buckingham accused the book of being laced with Darwinism. He proposed that Miller and Levine's book be supplemented with Of Pandas and People, which he said would balance evolution in the standard textbook. It would present the view of intelligent design. Well, most people in the uh, central Pennsylvania in 2004 had no idea what intelligent design was. Let me tell you a little bit about intelligent design. Now, from a scientific rather than from a theological standpoint, there's really only two ideas in intelligent design. And arguably one of them is a subset of the other, but let us go on. Michael Behe's notion of irreducible complexity is kind of like Reverend Paley um, pointed out in the early 1800s that very, very complicated biological phenomena cannot be explained through natural causes and therefore have to be explained by the actions of an intelligent agent. Now, um, Michael Behe always says intelligent agent. That's God. Okay. Um, they try to say that, well, no, we're not saying that there's any agent involved. We're just saying that intelligence has to be responsible for these very um, irreducibly complex structures that you see in biological systems, except that they mean God. There's only one intelligent agent that is capable of these kinds of, of um, uh, creations. The Second idea within intelligent design is William Dembski's design inference or sometimes called specified complexity. It's very, very similar, except instead of looking at complexity per se, Dembski stresses the improbability of complex structures forming by natural causes. Both of these guys assume that natural cause equates to chance, which is one of the major errors in intelligent design because we know many, many natural causes are not chance causes at all. Natural selection is not chance. There are elements of probability that are involved in the production of genetic variation upon which natural selection acts, but natural selection is not a chance process. Evolution is not a result of chance. It's a result of the actions of natural law on populations of biology. The foundation assumption of intelligent design, which I and most scientists find very unsettling, is that there's a whole class of phenomena that are unexplainable through natural causes. When you think about this, this is a science stopper. If you believe that there can be no natural explanation for a phenomenon, you're not gonna look for one. If you don't look for a natural explanation, you are guaranteed never to find it. So this basically brings science to a halt. If you place a whole series of um, phenomena off the table for scientific investigation. But this is what they do with what they call origin science. So there's lots and lots of things wrong with intelligent design. Someone will someday, I'm sure, come to the Silicon Valley skeptics and talk to you about intelligent design, but I, I won't spend any more time on it today. Now, the intelligent design proponents have tried to, very hard to distinguish intelligent design from an earlier form of creationism called creation science. Creation science tracks biblical literalism. It talks about special creation, really. God kind of poofing things into existence, except it claims there is scientific evidence and theory to support it. So that's why they call it creation science. Uh, the most common form is young earth creationism, which in addition to making claims that the earth is young, also makes claims about geology. Uh, through flood geology, they explain all the surface features of the planet as being the result of the effects of Noah's flood. And they have a number of other ideas that um, uh, don't stand up very well in, uh, scientifically. When you examine the tenets of intelligent design, you find that intelligent design is really a subset of creation science in the sense that everything, all of the claims of intelligent design pre-existed in creation science. 
Now, there are some things in creation science, like flood geology and age of the earth, that you don't find uh, intelligent design proponents talking about. Uh, but everything else that they talk about is pre-existing in intelligent design, which actually is one of the things that we pointed out during the trial. Now, proponents of intelligent design ignore um, uh, young earth creationism as much as they can because they're trying very hard to be viewed as a separate legitimate science and not be tied to their predecessors. Uh, they don't uh, cite the Bible in their support, which really annoys the uh, creation science people, by the way. Um, but based on their testimony in depositions and in court, I think it's very safe to say that none of the school board members in Dover, Pennsylvania conceived of intelligent design uh, in terms of specified complexity or information theory or complex specified information or irreducible complexity or any, any of the other kind of highfalutin hand waving that you get in intelligent design. It was an anti-evolutionary position. It sounded like creationism and that was good enough for them. <clears throat> so back to Dover. During the summer of 2004, the board told the science teachers to read the intelligent design book of pandas and people and watch the ID video, Icons of Evolution. The teachers were very unimpressed. In fact, they even joked about how bad the science was in the Icons of Evolution um, movie. But in the fall of 2004, the board told the teachers to basically suck it up. The board told the teachers that they would not order the textbook they wanted unless the teachers agreed to use pandas and people. Um, in other words, they basically held the purchase of new textbooks ransom uh, for the introduction of intelligent design. This, by the way, is very unusual. It's quite rare that a local school board is going to involve itself in this kind of micromanagement of the curriculum. Teachers continued to resist, although attempting to compromise where they could, but the board was relentless. Eventually, the board passed a policy in October 2004 that read, students will be made aware of gaps slash problems in Darwin's theory and of other theories of evolution, including, but not limited to, intelligent design. You can tell this was not written by the English department. Mm -hmm. um, the next month, the teachers notified the board that they were not willing to treat intelligent design as equal to evolution, and that if the board wanted them to teach intelligent design, they had better give them some more specific directives. There's a very good article by Dover biology teacher Jennifer Miller, who's the woman in the lower right-hand part of this picture, in the December 2015 issue of Reports of the NCSC. Uh, it really was an eye-opener. I learned some things that I didn't know from this article. She really gives, a, indeed, a teacher's eye view of this whole controversy. It's a fascinating story. And this is all on, online. You can get it for free. <clears throat> As described by Jennifer in this article, the board countered by telling teachers that they had to read a statement to students before beginning the lesson on evolution. This was a four paragraph long statement that basically denigrated evolution and encouraged the students to investigate intelligent design. The teachers did something incredibly brave. They refused. This takes guts because the school board is your boss. They can tell the superintendent to fire you. I think only, only I, I know for sure of one school board member, that's the Bertha Spar in the uh, uh, lower left hand um, uh, of the picture there, the older woman with the glasses. Uh, Bertha was tenured. I think one other school, uh, one other teacher was tenured. All the rest of them could have been fired very easily. But they stood their ground. They wrote a statement to the um, school board. They published it in, it was published in the local newspaper where they basically said, you know, we will not violate our professional integrity by teaching something that is clearly non-scientific and not good for our students. I mean, they, they were, the teachers were fabulous. <clears throat> In summary, although the teachers tried very hard to get the board to compromise on the textbook and the ID policies, and many, uh, there were a number of contentious school board meetings in which uh, citizens stood up and said, no, we don't want this. Clergymen stood up and said, no, we don't want this. Um, 
the board just refused to budge. So frankly, the only recourse available to citizens in Dover was to sue. Footnote, don't sue. <laughs> if you have any other possibility for resolving an issue, resolve the issue. S lawsuits are enormously expensive. They're physically and emotionally and intellectually draining for everybody who's involved in them. They tear apart communities. Some of the stories that the plaintiffs would tell about um, the treatment that they got from friends and neighbors, people they thought were friends and neighbors, or just sort of people shifting away from them in the supermarket checkout line and little subtle things like that, in addition to the actual threats that they received. I mean, no, if you can possibly negotiate your way out of some of these difficult, this is what the National Center for Science Education has done for decades. We have negotiated behind the scenes to keep from going to a trial. But frankly, if you've got to go to trial, then there was no recourse because the school board was totally adamant. If you have to go to trial, go with a case like, like Dover because this had a lot of things going well for it, which of course is clearer in hindsight naturally than it is at the time. So NCSC had been working with citizens in Dover and we teamed up with others to challenge the Board of Education. Our team consisted of NCSE, the ACLU, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which is another civil liberties organization, and a large law firm based in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Pepper Hamilton, where um, uh, one of NCSE's legal advisory committee members was a partner. We filed on December 18th, 2004, although we had begun preparing for the trial uh, earlier in the fall, as soon as we knew we had to do something about this. The trial began the following September and took place over six weeks. On the other side was the Thomas More Law Center from Michigan, whose motto is the sword and shield of people of faith, led by Richard Thompson. Now, why couldn't we just go to the judge and say, judge, you know, we're a bunch of scientists, we're a bunch of teachers. Um, intelligent design is really crappy science. It's really, a, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be taught to students. Tell the school board to knock it off. However sensible that would be, we're talking about a court of law. And there is no constitutional law against teaching bad science. You can constitutionally teach that the world is flat instead of spherical if you want, and there's no law that says you can't do that. So what, you know, what we did have to use to challenge this um, bad science was actually the fact that it was not just bad science, but it was advocacy of religion, because there is a constitutional provision against uh, advocating religion in the public schools. It's called the First Amendment to the Constitution. It has two clauses uh, involving um, religion, the establishment and free exercise clauses. When you take these together, the establishment clause says that you cannot advance religion in the public institutions. The free exercise clause says you cannot inhibit religion in public institutions. If you take these together, it means public institutions have to be religiously neutral. And that is the basis of our argument against Kitz Miller, against um, uh, the teaching of intelligent design is that it's, it is a religious view and its teaching would advance a religion. It would violate the Establishment Clause. Now, because the bottom line is a constitutional issue, what the defense's lawyers had to demonstrate was that teaching of intelligent design was being done for a secular reason. They had to claim that there was a pedagogical, a good science, critical thinking, whatever. There was a secular pedagogical reason for teaching ID because if they agreed that the reason for teaching ID was to promote religion, they were dead in the water because the Constitution disallows that right off the bat. They also had to demonstrate, because this is part of the secular argument, that intelligent design is valid science. Now, interestingly enough, and by the way, I'm not a lawyer, I don't even play one on TV, but I can hum a few bars when it comes to this particular issue. Um, and I also run everything past our legal advisory committee, so I you know, never depend upon legal advice from a physical anthropologist, but I think you can probably go along with me on this one. The, the way the law works in this particular area is that 
a policy or a law can have, I don't mean the law, the way the interpretation of the Constitution is, is usually done, is that a, a law or a policy may have religious implications, but that in itself is, doesn't necessarily mean it gets struck down. I mean, evolution has religious implications, right? But we still teach it. If the only thing that it has is religion, that I, intelligent design has is religious implications, then they lose. So they had to demonstrate that intelligent design was valid science. That was a big part of their secular reason for teaching it. And of course, they also had to somehow slide in the idea that evolution was weak science because of course that would shore up intelligent design. Anticipating their approach, we had to show that in fact ID is religion, <clears throat> that in fact it's just a reworked form of creation science. The Supreme Court had previously declared in 1987 that it was not constitutional to teach creation science. So if we could show that ID was just relabeled creation science, we'd win. I mean, you know, if A equals B and B is unconstitutional, so is A, right? That's the logic that we had there. But in order to do this, we also had to show that there was no valid secular reason for teaching intelligent design. We had to refute their claim that ID was science, and we had to demonstrate, in fact, that um, not only was intelligent design not science in the sense of following the precepts of how scientists do science, um, but we also had to demonstrate that it was factually wrong, that its fact claims were wrong as well. <clears throat> and we also had to... Uh, make the point that evolution really was good science because of course we knew the other side was going to attack it and because attacking evolution is really what the textbook of pandas and people is all about. There was a lot of science presented in, to the judge. It was like the biology class you wish you could have taken, said Margaret Talbot in The New Yorker. At the end of the first day of testimony after hearing Ken Miller expound with his usual great enthusiasm on cell biology, the judge joked, class dismissed. Um, now I mentioned that there were really only two scientific concepts in intelligent design. There's irreducible complexity and specified information. We prepared to deal with both of these concepts, with both Behe and Dembski, but um, in a story that in itself is worth telling, but there's only so much time. Um, a number of the witnesses on the other, the expert witnesses on the other side ended up bailing before the um, trial, one of them being Bill Dembski. So we didn't actually have to bring up um, complex specified information in the uh, case. We could really concentrate on Behe, much to Behe's dismay, I'm sure. We began with Ken Miller attacking Behe's idea of irreducible complexity and his Behe's specific examples of supposed phenomena that evolution couldn't explain, like the bacteria flagellum. In fact, there were so many references to the bacteria flagellum that the um, uh, newspaper started referring to it as the flagellum trial. Uh, the immune system and the blood clotting system were also uh, examples, according to Behe, of things that were irreducibly complex and that uh, natural processes like natural selection could not explain. Kevin Padian is a paleontologist up the road a ways at the University of California. He was our last expert witness. <clears throat> we did that for a reason. We started with a scientist and ended with a scientist, and our other witnesses were in between, because we wanted to signal, signal to the judge that science was important in this case, and that we wanted him to consider the science. He could have just ruled on the religion issue, but we wanted him to look at the science as well. Padian talked about pandas and people, because you know, the intelligent design people don't just screw up cellular and molecular biology. They also get organismic biology really wrong. And, and the paleontology, the paleontological record is also pretty well trashed by them. So we had uh, Kevin dealing with the organismic biology part of, of the uh, field. He also talked about the strength of evolution and he also, uh, in addition to other um, witnesses, uh, made the tie between intelligent design and creation science. Um, I really encourage you to get online at the NCSC website where we have assembled virtually all of the textual material of this case, including the um, witness statements, the depositions, and the actual 
trial testimony and the cross-examinations. Um, particularly Behe's cross-examination is absolutely fascinating. Well, first of all, the plaintiff's witness, our side testifies, and then the defense gets to put their witnesses on. And of course, that means we get to cross-examine their witnesses. The first, first witness called was Dr. Michael Behe, probably the best scientist in intelligent design, which I don't mean to be damning with faint praise because there aren't very many scientists in the intelligent design stable. Most of the really prominent proponents of intelligent design are philosophers. They really are very thick on the ground with philosophers and lawyers, interestingly enough. Now, Behe's job was to show the scientific validity of intelligent design. He needed to really convince the judge that ID was separate from creationism, it was a valid scientific undertaking that deserved being taught in the public schools. He didn't do this. Um, on the contrary, uh, as if you read the judge's decision, you'll notice many references to, and Dr. Behe agreed with the plaintiffs that, and Dr. Behe agreed with the plaintiffs that he ended up having to agree with a number of, of things that supported our side. He agreed to, with us that intelligent design requires going outside of science as she is normally practiced in the sense that intelligent design does refer to this intelligent agent, which is God. And one of the ground rules, rules is not really the right term, but certainly the way science is practiced these days is methodological, naturalism. We restrict ourselves to natural causes because those are the ones that can be tested and science is all about testing stuff. Um, Behe agreed that intelligent design was not part of mainstream science because it went outside of natural cause to invoke supernatural cause. Um, he agreed that intelligent design was not accepted within the scientific community, that it was in fact a fringe science. <clears throat> Even his concept of irreducible complexity was shown to be hollow. Ken Miller pretty much deconstructed it. And as I say, the cross-examination of Michael Behe is really a, a very interesting experience. Um, uh, our lawyers, well, our lawyers were very well coached, if I do say so myself. The judge agreed with us that even if the concept of irreducible complexity um, were, was valid, which I think we showed pretty well that it wasn't. But even if it were valid, it's an argument against evolution, not an argument for intelligent design. And Behe ended up agreeing with that. So Behe was really, uh, he was supposed to be the strongest uh, witness for their side, which is why they began with him. Uh, but he really did not uh, uh, make the grade. He was unable to come up with any testable um, explanation uh, within intelligent design. And of course, if you can't provide testable explanations, you are not doing science. In the 1992 Darwin's Black, Darwin's Black Box, his big magnum opus, Behe had contended that there was not then, nor would there ever be, a natural explanation for the immune system. When we had our, um, dur during the plaintiff's witness testimony, Ken Miller had presented a very detailed discussion of the immune system, uh, showing that in fact it wasn't irreducibly complex, that all the various components, most of the various components of the immune system were in fact very uh, explainable through natural causes. When we had the chance to cross-examine Behe, Eric Rothschild put a stack of 58 peer-reviewed publications, 12 books and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system, plopped it down on the witness table and said, Dr. Behe, isn't this enough? It was a very dramatic moment, obviously. <laughs> Behe just kind of smiled fairly weakly and said, no, that's not sufficient. The judge noted that. The judge was very unimpressed with that response. Um, and he even mentioned in the decision this stack of evidence right here. Another point we raised uh, in the cross-examination was that intelligent design had not gone through peer review by the scientific community. Intelligent design proponents were not submitting research to journals for peer review and publication. The way they always answer that is, oh, but look at all these books that we've written. Look at books like Darwin's Black Box, that's peer reviewed. Now, I don't know how many of you are scientists, but there's a big difference between a journal and a book. 
a book gets published because it's going to sell because the publisher believes that people are going to buy that book and it will sell. The good books also have good content, but the major, you know, the bottom line for whether something gets, for whether a book gets published is, is it going to sell? Um, a journal article, on the other hand, is a totally different kind of kettle of fish, to mix a metaphor. Um, a journal article uh, is not intended to make money. These days, they even charge you for publishing, or they charge you for your, for your illustrations. It's really quite sad, but um, the purpose of a journal article is to communicate scientific ideas to your scientific colleagues. Uh, many, many good books, solid scientific books, which would make great contributions to our, our knowledge of the natural world, never get published, not because they're not valid science, but because there's no market for them. Conversely, many books get published, which are crap, but because they have an audience, they're going to get published anyway. So, you know, this you can't really say, well, we have all these books on intelligent design, therefore we're peer reviewed, because the process of peer review works very differently in books than it works in journal articles. In deposition, Behe had countered that Darwin's black box had undergone stringent peer review by the publisher and had identified Dr. Michael Acheson as one of the peer reviewers. However, NCSE's Nick Motsky had seen a comment from Dr. Acheson. This was actually on a Christian website where uh, Acheson was talking about um, Behe's book uh, and how God moves in mysterious ways kind of thing. And, in this discussion, uh, Atchison suggested he hadn't reviewed the book quite as thoroughly as being presented. So in the trial, we countered Behe's claim that Darwin's black box had undergone stringent scientific review by quoting Dr. Atchison. In this article, Atchison wrote, we spent approximately 10 minutes on the phone. After hearing a description of the work, I suggested that the editor should sh seriously consider publishing the manuscript. I told him that the origins of life issue was still up in the air. It sounded like this Behe fellow might have some good ideas, although I could not be certain since I had never seen the manuscript. So Behe's vaunted peer review of Darwin's Black Box consisted of an editor's 10-minute phone call to someone who had not actually seen the manuscript. How many of you are scientists? Wouldn't you love it if your peer-reviewed articles could go through that? So, oh no, I digress here. Okay, a big part of our case was convincing the judge that intelligent design was just creation science repackaged. In preparation for the Dover trial, NCSE scoured its archives and found a Students for Origins research article from 1981 reporting that the Foundation for Thought and Ethics was preparing a biology textbook. The textbook was described as being sensitively written to present both evolution and creation while limiting discussion to scientific data. FTE, the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, is the publisher of Pandas and People. This got our curiosity up. Um, the Foundation for Thought and Ethics textbook uh, was not to appear for several years. They were looking for a secular publisher rather than a religious press, and they had a lot of trouble finding it. Our hypothesis was that this book talked about in 1981 became of pandas and people, but we had to demonstrate it. Our lawyers um, subpoenaed any manuscript of creation and evolution textbooks in the possession of the Foundation for Thought and Ethics. You can imagine how unhappy they were when that subpoena showed up on their doorstep. But to their credit, they behaved honorably and honestly and gave us seven manuscripts. These are Creation Biology, 1983, Biology and Creation, 1986, Biology and Origins, 1987. Notice all of these have creationist kinds of languages in them. And then there were two manuscript labels, Pandas and People, one dated 1987, which we cleverly have called version one. One, um, the second version, also 1987, but there are various textual um, components that suggested to us that it was ap it was a later on in the year, it was a second manuscript following, which we call version two. And then the first edition of Pandas and People, 
and the second edition of Pandas and People. Now, my colleague Wes Ellsbury at NCSE wrote a neat little computer program that, um, well, of course, first of all, when we got these, we scanned them all and OCR'd them, and um, uh, Wes wrote this little script that would count five word and 10 word uh, stretches so that we could compare these manuscripts. Yes, we could easily demonstrate that this was a series of publications that uh, were in sequence. Um, and then we started doing some interesting things like how many times does the word creationism occur? How many times does the term intelligent design occur? And we found a very interesting thing. The red line is the number of times the term creationist or cognates occur. The blue line, the number of times the phrase intelligent design occurs. Note that the lines cross between the two 1987 drafts of Pandas and People. Well, those of you who have sharp ears may recall what happened in 1987. Supreme Court decision. Bingo, you got it. The Supreme Court struck down creation science as being unconstitutional. Somehow or another, the word creationism seemed to become very scarce in these manuscripts. <clears throat> it certainly appears as if the authors just changed the words and kept the same ideas. To drive this point home even more clearly, we made comparisons of sections of the various drafts, including a very interesting paragraph. Now, this is the first book, Biology and Creation, 1986. Creation means the various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks, and wings. And the same wording occurs through Biology and Origins, 1987. And even in the first edition of Pandas and People, draft number one, again, creation means the various forms of life. They, they use this creation language again. Now, again, what happened in 1987? The Supreme Court struck down creation science. Oh, look, draft number two substitutes the phrase intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings. We were chanting that around the office. We were just so, <laughs> fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings. Ah! It was probably not coincidental that this change occurred on the opposite side of the Supreme Court decision. We had a number of things like this that impressed the judge. Now, Kitzmiller wasn't a case one, again, totally upon the science. Uh, remember, we needed to show that ID was religious. That was one way of doing it. And ideally, we wanted to show that the school board had a religious intent for passing the policy. The school board helped us enormously in this regard because um, the school board members themselves were on record with the newspapers. Um, people had heard them make very religious statements at school board meetings, such as Mr. Buckingham's um, 2,000 years ago, someone died on a cross, can't someone take a stand for him? Not usually something that would come up in a discussion of, say, algebra. Uh, uh, they, but all the school board members, when they were deposed, denied that they had ever said anything like this, denied they ever had religious intent, were only doing it for the critical thinking um, uh, improvement of our students, which, you know, was quite a surprise. Um, but this is why you have discovery, and this is why you collect a lot of information. We did have something of a he said, she said uh, debate. Uh, we actually had to bring in the reporters from the local two newspapers who had reported on these people. Um, it, it, that, like I say, there are so many things to talk about with this case. I can only talk about so many. Defense witnesses William Buckingham and Alan Bonsell also did not endear themselves to the judge when it became clear that they had been minimally evasive and perhaps at worst lied under oath during their depositions. When they had been deposed, both claimed that they had no idea where money to purchase 60 copies of Pandas and People had come from. Actually, Mr. Buckingham had solicited money from members of his church. He had gone into his church one Sunday and said, you know, if anybody wants to give, you can put money in the you know, box outside the minister's door, and people would put envelopes with money, and he collected them all and um, deposited them and then wrote a check to um, Mr. Bonzel's father. We had a check 
written by Mr. Buckingham to Mr. Bonzel's father, Donald Bonzel, who is the one who purchased the books. Under cross-examination during the trial, both Bonzel and Buckingham dodged and weaved and ended up infuriating the judge, which is not a really good thing to do to annoy the judge. Uh, because they, they were on record saying one thing in their depositions, but clearly they had lied in depositions, so on the stand, things got very uncomfortable for them. If you read the, the um, uh, cross-examination of, of Mr. Bonsell as particularly, you see the judge says, excuse me, I'm going to ask some questions. That is very rare. The judges rarely go, <laughs> and that's, the, we were, I mean, the lawyers were, you know, their just eyes were like saucers because this just <laughs> never happened. You, the trial transcripts are most interesting. A real turning point was the discovery of some footage from a local TV station where school board member Bill Buckingham admitted that his intent was to balance well, creationism with evolution. The for biology was laced with Darwinism from the beginning to the end. William Buckingham is head of the curriculum committee for the Dover School District. He's also a board member. He strongly believes creationism needs to be taught in the classroom. My opinion that the uh, it's okay to teach Darwin, but you have to balance it with something else, such as creationism. Did he look very nervous to you? Did he look like a deer in the headlights? Because when he was put on, when we played this clip in the courtroom, and um, um, Mr. Buckingham. Um, had to sort of face the music. He said, well, you know, I, I, was, I was trying not to say the word creationism, but I was like a deer in the headlights and, and I was ambushed by the reporter. He looked kind of relaxed to me. I don't know about you. Um, reporter Mark Argento, who's a very funny columnist for the York Daily News, he should be writing for a bigger paper. I think he's really quite funny. Mark Argento, referred to this as the Homer Simpson defense. Don't say creationism, don't say creationism, oh, creationism. Um, so what happened? Well, like I say, I spoiled the punchline already. Um, science won, ID lost, and the little gray-haired lady over there in the corner is grinning for a very, very good reason, because it was a huge victory. The judge's decision was over 130 pages long, it was very carefully argued, and it was devastating to the intelligent design position. I'll just let you read that yourself, because it is very powerful. Utterly no place in a science curriculum. He should quit mincing words. <laughs> we successfully demonstrated that first, ID was a movement outside of science with no valid scientific discoveries or contributions. And secondly, and of primary importance to the case, that ID was a religious movement. Thus, the scientific claims were a sham used to promote a sectarian religion in the public schools. The judge granted plaintiffs $2 million in court costs, which I suspect made a lot of school districts swallow hard when thinking about passing similar policies. Remember, though, that Kitzmiller wasn't appealed. Uh, the school board election in 2005 voted the rascals out, and a new board, which, by the way, included one of the Dover plaintiffs, um, didn't support the old law and didn't want to waste money appealing it, which is kind of too bad because Boy, if you ever want to go to an appeals court with a case, you want to go with a case like Dover because it was so good. I mean, we really did a good job. I'm sorry. I just have to say that. It would have been a wonderful case to appeal. Um, but the, you know, Kitzmiller is precedent in the middle district of Pennsylvania. If I had a map here of Pennsylvania, here's Pennsylvania, it's long. The eastern district, the middle district, the western district. It is precedent only here. However, it is such a strongly written and carefully argued and so well supported decision that it is going to have a huge amount of influence in any other jurisdiction, even if it is not precedent. And that is, I think, the thing to remember here. But even if the decision is only precedent here, uh, I, think it's, I think the decision has been influential in a number of ways that are not going to be measured in the courts. 
One thing that would likely have turned out differently is a lawsuit in Georgia called Selman versus Cobb County. This was a lawsuit brought in over a 2002 decision of the Board of Education in Cobb County, Georgia, to require a textbook that included evolution to have a disclaimer sticker. Some of you might remember the Cobb County disclaimer. Um, in 2004, just as we were gearing up for Kitzmiller, Selman versus Cobb County went to trial. In January 2005, the federal district court issued his opinion that the stickers were unconstitutional. And this was because of the history of the teaching of evolution. The stickers were recognized as part of a plan to advance religion, therefore unconstitutional. The judge got it because he looked at the history of the case and recognized that theory, not fact language of the sticker was just a strategy of creationists. The stickers were taken out of books. They spent the summer, you know, um, they hired a bunch of students, which must have been fun for them. We get to deface our textbooks. And they, uh, they, they ripped out all of the, all of the um, stickers, although the school district did appeal. And in December of 2005, which was right when Kitzmiller was coming down, a three-judge panel heard the oral arguments and the following May of 06 vacated the district court decision and sent the case back for retrial on procedural grounds. So we geared up once again for a trial. Except this time, Selman versus Cobb County, there had been some irregularities, some deadlines missed, some problems uh, that had been involved, but this time was going to be different. The plaintiffs decided to switch attorneys and asked two of the Dover attorneys, Eric Rothschild and Richard Katsky, as shown here, at the Beer Can Museum in uh, York, Pennsylvania. I mentioned that we had this 10-year um, uh, Dover Plaintiffs Legal Team uh, reunion. It was held at the Beer Can Museum, uh, which is also the home of reporter Lori Lebo. Every single room in, in that house looks like that. Floor to ceiling, he's a beer can collector. This is the most amazing place. He, they've turned it into a B&B, &B, so if you're traveling through central Pennsylvania, you can stay at the beer can museum. Um, Eric is the shorter one, Richard is the taller one. Standing next to them is Rob Pennock, who is one of the expert witnesses. Now, also changing were the expert witnesses. For reasons that I'm not going to go into, during the original trial for Cobb County, scientific testimony wasn't allowed. Um, fortunately, Ken Miller was called as the author of his textbook, which was a material aspect of the trial. And Ken very cleverly started slipping in all of the science. Uh, the opposing attorney, of course, objected because the judge had decided, but the judge said, no, you know, tell me more about that. What, what's this flagellum stuff? <laughs> so Ken was able to actually get a lot of science into the, um, but this time it would be different. We could just do straight up science from, the, from day one, the whole everything would start all over again. The uh, witnesses would include Ken, who is the man in the middle there. To his right is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, Brian Alters, who is another Dover witness, and I was going to be a witness for this trial as well. I don't feel bad at all that I didn't get to go. Um, in December of 2006, the school school board threw in the towel. They decided that they would settle with the uh, plaintiffs. The decision required that the district never again insert anti-evolution disclaimers in textbooks or in any other way disclaim evolution, no written statements, no oral statements like in Dover, that they just leave evolution the hell alone. The district was also enjoined from excising or redacting materials on evolution in student science textbook. In other words, you can't you know, block out the pages. And they were also enjoined in the settlement that they had to follow the state of Georgia's directives about the teaching of evolution, which aren't great, but they're a whole lot better than Cobb County's were. Um, basically, the settlement was, don't ever be bad again, is <laughs> kind of what it boiled down to. Um, would the district have settled so quickly if they weren't about to receive the full Kitzmiller, so to speak? Um, I don't think so. I think the fact that the that the lawyers changed, they got people on the plaintiff side who actually knew this subject matter very, very well. These were experienced trial lawyers by this time. I think that the uh, school board decided, you know, this is not going to be worth it. Let's just throw in the towel. 
possible that the new trial would have been um, more successful, but you know, it's always good to win, whether through trial or settlement. The Kitzmiller decision was so strong, so solid, and so thorough that the thought of requiring the teaching of intelligent design was basically abandoned by intelligent design proponents. In 2005, we knew that Pennsylvania, Indiana, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Utah legislators were poised to introduce legislation requiring the teaching of ID. New York had already done so earlier in the year. Um, they were just waiting to see what would happen with the Kitzmiller case. Um, there were, I, doubtless there were other states that we just didn't know about. Doubtless there were lots and lots of school districts that were also poised to pass Dover-like policies had the Kitzmiller decision come out differently. Uh, there had been ID-friendly uh, legislation introduced in many, many states, in almost every state. I think we can assume that these bills would have had a much greater chance of being passed if Kitzmiller hadn't turned out the way it did. There have, in fact, been over 60, that's six zero, bills introduced in state legislatures since 2005 that would compromise the teaching of evolution in some way. Only a couple of them mentioned intelligent design, but many, many, many more would have. Many of these 60 bills were of the academic freedom form, which don't call for teaching of creationism, don't call for teaching of intelligent design. They merely call for teaching um, the evidence against evolution. I don't know of any, but you know, I know where you can find the evidence against evolution. It's in the intelligent design books. Um, I put together a little graphic showing the states that have had academic freedom bills introduced since 2005, as well as those that would be likely candidates for passing ID-friendly legislation, and I thought I would share this with you. The red is states where academic freedom legislation has been introduced since Kitzmiller, not necessarily passed, only two of them passed, which I think makes it quite likely that pro-ID legislation will be introduced. The pink are states where ID-friendly legislation had been introduced at some time in the recent past. That doesn't leave a whole lot of states left. There are many districts around the country that have flirted with ID as well. If Kitzmiller versus Dover had gone the other way, I think it's safe to say that those states and districts might well have reintroduced legislation and policies. The trickle down for K Kitzmiller would have had seriously serious consequences in other ways as well. If ID had been declared legal to teach, there would have been considerable pressure through states to include ID and possibly other creationist ideas in state science education standards. Even before Kitzmiller, the main ID promoting organization, the Discovery Institute in Seattle, had actually shifted its approach from proposing ID be included in the curriculum to promoting a backdoor form of creationism that called for denigrating evolution. Their goal was to encourage the teaching that evolution is weak or unsubstantiated, figuring if students can come to the conclusion, oh, well, if evolution doesn't do it, God must have done it. So it's, it is a backdoor form of creationism, because most students think in this dichotomous fashion. In early 2000, these laws took the form of teaching alternate theories to evolution, which of course is a euphemism for creationism and intelligent design, or teaching the weaknesses of evolution, which eventually morphed into the um, into the uh, uh, academic freedom legislation. These states already had proposed modifications along one of these ways, either or. If Kitzmiller had gone the other way, these euphemisms would no longer be necessary. States could just teach straight up creationism. And let's not forget what happens to textbooks when states say, teach X instead of Y. The publishers salute smartly and give them the books they want. If state standards were intelligent design friendly, you can count on textbooks, including the subject as well, as publishers write books that will sell in the market, including the teaching of intelligent design. So intelligent design would have the imprimatur of an official looking textbook purchased by the school district. Intelligent design was an effort to mask a religious foundation of creationism so that it could be taught in state schools. By renaming intelligent design evidence against evolution, we have a new wolf in sheep's clothing. This is the creationism du jour. Kitzmiller stopped efforts to require the teaching of ID, but it did not stop the anti-evolution movement. That said, it would have been much worse 
if Kitzmiller had gone the other way. I think we owe a lot to Kitzmiller. Now, if you want to know more information about Kitzmiller, go to ncse.com and go to this teaser bar here where it says legal cases. You can find all the court transcripts, all of the um, depositions, the whole shooting, all the briefs, the whole works. It uh, makes fascinating reading. Uh, also check out the blog. This is a fairly new, um, well, a couple years, uh, uh, e event at NCSC. My former colleagues do a lot of very, very good writing. So thank you for listening. And do, do come to the next meeting of the Silicon Valley skeptics. Right, Hunter? Right. <laughs>
on the state level, they're still looking around for legislators that they can peddle their um, their um, uh, model resol their, their model law for. Uh, it's an academic freedom law, basically. What it is, it's, it's a permissive law that, that basically uh, inhibits uh, administrators from clamping down on teachers who want to bring ID uh, into the classroom. And, but it's all couched in terms of, of, um, of uh, academic freedom and critical thinking and that kind of, you know. Knowing the history of these organizations, I am a little suspicious. But uh, they're still around. Uh, they're not making any influence in the science community. Um, when they first started publishing books in the uh, 90s and 2000s, uh, you know, Behe's book was reviewed in science. Um, Dembski's book was reviewed in uh, professional um, mathematics journals, panned, both of them. Um, uh, Behe's second uh, book was also reviewed in Science Magazine by Ken Miller, so, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, no, I, I, I mention this because I think it's extremely important that we help people understand that ID is not being ignored. ID was listened to uh, for 20 years, and scientists kept giving feedback as to why you are wrong about the immune system, why you are wrong about the bacteria flagellum, why you are wrong about natural selection, why you are wrong about, but they never, ever, ever changed their model. So now the scientific community says, okay, we're done, bye. They're being ignored, but they're not being ignored because we have some sort of vendetta against religion. That's not the idea. They're being ignored because they're not producing any kind of science. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they can't still be influential in the general public. I think, though, actually, the traditional young earth creationists of the Institute for Creation Research and the Answers in Genesis type are actually reaching more people than the intelligent design people. Um, uh, Answers in Genesis is going to build this new ARC park. Uh, they have, they're, they're the folks up in northern Kentucky with the Creation Museum. Uh, that Bill um, Nye debated Ken Ham, you know, y'all know that one. Um, they seem to be raising a sufficient, um, uh, sufficient money to build a replica ark, which will be <clears throat> another tourist attraction in northern Kentucky. So, yeah, I mean, w my colleagues at NC, I'm retired now, you know, so I'm do I don't do anything anymore. But my colleagues at NCSC um, monitor the Discovery Institute. They keep track of what they're doing and um, thwart them at every opportunity, obviously, but they're not doing much. So I'm not really worried about them a whole lot. Hi, uh, thanks for everything. We enjoyed it a lot. Thank so you. question I have is uh, whatever we're talking now that 10 years ago and what happened today, what is it today that's really burning that we will talk about 10 years from now, say, hey, this is great that it happened today in the US. What kind of question that's really burning right now? Does that the problem that we are having now is uh, just more again the, these intelligent design? Excuse me, these um, academic freedom kinds of laws and bills. There's always a half dozen to a dozen introduced every year. Um, two of them have passed in the past ten years, which is very unfortunate. Um, we worry very much about their being cloned and show it up ex elsewhere. The Legal Advisory Committee doesn't feel that on, this, on the face of these bills, on the surface of these bills, that they are directly challengeable as the Dover policy was. Uh, in order to challenge these um, Academic Freedom Acts, you have to do what they call an as-applied challenge. In other words, you have to find a teacher who is bringing in creationist material under the guise of this policy, and then you can go to a judge and say, see, <laughs> this is bad stuff. You know, you have to strike down this, um, this, right, this uh, law because it is resulting in bad, you know, it's resulting in advocacy of religion and really bad science teaching too, although that's not the legal issue. So that's, you know, we, we have to keep our eyes open for those sorts of cases. Yes. Are uh, school boards still a big issue? Uh, you know, some of those elections are very sparsely uh, voted on. 
yeah, I think thank you so much for that very important point. Um, I remember, I remember a number of years ago, the city of New York had a school board election, and of course, it was incredibly contentious because there were all of these issues about um, supposedly the gay agenda was being, you know, just a bunch of nonsense. Anyway, that there were there were issues that people were just really fighting tooth and nail about, and uh, twice as many people voted in that. New York City school board election as had voted previously. 15% of the registered voters. Okay. That tells you that probably every school board in this country is elected by a minority of citizens. And who are the citizens who feel the most strongly about education? Oftentimes, there are people who hold extreme views. So if you don't want people who hold extreme views being elected to your local school board, when those election, when those down ballot um, offices come into your, uh, your vision, um, I hope you have done a little bit of preparation and thought about who is running, what do they stand for. Go to the candidates' night. They hold them in your local schools. The PTAs, the League of Women Voters, will have candidates' nights. Collect the information. Find out what these people stand for. And be sure that your school district doesn't get taken over by extremists. Remember, most school boards are elected by a minority because people finish the top part of the ballot and they just skip the bottom part of the ballot. And that's where your school board election is. So... If I ask two questions, um, the first one though is, how much did the weight of this particular judge carry? I mean, he was appointed from a conservative group. Uh, he had a really conservative, strong background, and he came down so adamantly on it. Did that make a difference as opposed to if it had been a judge that had been perceived as more neutral going into it? I mean, a lot of people seem to think he really turned around. Well, the nice thing about Judge Jones is that he's really a quite He's, I mean, I have had the opportunity to, to meet him on a number of occasions after the trial. Uh, uh, we've served on panels together and we've been asked to speak at joint uh, events and stuff like that. So I've gotten to know him. He even came to the reunion for about a half hour. It was so cool. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, he when you meet him, he strikes you as being a very fair-minded person He'll, he'll tell you, uh, he said publicly, I'm not revealing any confidences, that he had no more science than just your general liberal arts education. He went to Dickinson College, by the way, which is a good Eastern liberal arts college. And, but that general liberal arts education gave him the analytical tools, shall we say, that he could use to you know, really look at what we were saying, look at what the ID people were saying, and evaluate these two sets of claims and find out where the holes were. Um, he's a smart guy, and he let the, uh, the evidence speak for itself. Now, of course, before the trial, uh, certain people associated with the intelligent des design movement were chortling with glee that uh, this George Bush appointee, uh, who is a church-going Republican, um, was, uh, you know, got the straw for the Kitzmiller trial because he is in our pocket. And boy, we're really going to see, we're really going to see uh, evolution in the vice. Darwin is really going to be squeezed because, because you can't, you know, you can't prevaricate in a court of law. You've just got to deal directly with the issues. Then he came out with his decision, which was, um, how many of you have read the decision? I know quite a few of you had, yeah. It's, see all the hands that went up? Those of you who haven't, read it. It's really a great decision. As soon as the decision came out, he was an activist judge. <laughs> <laughs> he was an activist judge that, um, you know, it clearly was bamboozled by the, um, you know, the, the, fast-talking, um, um, high-tech. Uh, I, there are many things that one can talk about with Kitzmiller. One thing I didn't talk about was what a high-tech trial this was. Um, on the desk of the judge was a monitor. On the desk of the on the witness desk, there was a monitor, and the uh, lawyers both had monitors. And then for us plebeians in the court, there was a big screen. 
And our guys brought in all this technology and simultaneously broadcast to the screen, the lawyers, the judge, and the witness, um, the various um, trial demonstratives, the eight by 10 glossies, so to speak, that were necessary. I mean, we were dealing with some very complicated cell biology and molecular biology to a judge who was a layman, uh, who didn't know anything about any of this. A lot of the, you know, we had to really simplify and really choose the examples that would be the clearest and that we could show with a thousand words, so to speak, get a picture that would really clearly communicate our ideas. So Pepper Hamilton invested a lot of money in technology in order to make this trial really work. Um, so, you know, but that was just uh, bamboozling the judge with um, ha fancy hand waving. Gone were the comments about how in a court of law, you really have to be. <laughs> Actually, a court of law is a crappy place to be doing science. I mean, you know, when you think about it, you don't want judges deciding what is good science and what is bad science. Uh, Judge Jones was strongly criticized for the definition of science that he used. He pointed out in his uh, decision, actually, that the definition of science that he relied upon in judging that ID was not science was the definition that both the plaintiffs and the defense agreed upon. All right? So, you know, uh, there was a lot of carping after the trial, but it, um, it clearly, <laughs> it was a bit self-serving. Hi, I know uh, the NCSC focuses on uh, creation versus evolution. Um, and climate change. And climate change, okay. excellent. Okay, yeah, yes. I was gonna ask about uh, astronomy and whether there are some uh, religious uh, efforts to, to put in some other kind of view about the... Not really. No. Uh, for one thing, uh, K-12 does not get very much into astronomy. You get a little bit of you know, the solar system, and we can argue about Pluto, but you know, there's not a whole lot of, <laughs> of uh, stuff that really goes on. Um, NCSC's focus is on, I guess you could call it science denialism. Um, ideas that are well accepted in the science community, like evolution, like climate change, uh, which a substantial portion of the population disagrees with, does not accept the science. And our job is to, their job, I'm retired, uh, NCSC's staff's job is to look at those two subjects in that uh, universe as it plays out in the education field, where those topics, where the rejection of those topics affect science education, that's NCSC's niche. Now you've got the big environmental organizations, they've got teams of lawyers, they can go after the polluters, they can go after a lot of things having to do with um, CO2 production and stuff like that. We are a little tiny organization, we look at education. And the reason why we got into um, climate change about three years ago is that we were getting reports uh, that teachers were getting hammered for the teaching of climate change, just like they were getting hammered for the teaching of evolution. And so when we investigated, we found the, so many parallels. Not by the way, uh, especially because of religion. Um, the, but, but if you step back a little bit, the structure is the same. The reason why people object to their kids learning evolution is because of an ideological position. That is a religious ideology. The reason people object to their kids learning climate change or object to the idea of global warming in general is because of an ideological position. It's not a religious ideology like it is with evolution. It is, on the contrary, a political and an economic ideology. Uh, free market fundamentalism, if you will. Um, uh, political conservatism um, stands for certain things which they believe, values which they believe are threatened um, by the attacks on, uh, the attacks on capitalism as it, it is, as it is often framed. At any rate, you've got an ideological foundation which is motivating the public portions of the public to object to well-accepted scientific views being taught in the schools. And that's kind of the niche that NCSC tries to carve out. And I hope you will all support them on that. Without something like the First Amendment, um, defending climate science, yeah. how are you going about doing this? 
Uh, it's not going to be legal cases, that's for sure, because there is nothing in the Constitution that says that uh, you know you have to teach climate change. Um, no, the, it, it, it would. I mean, there are legal issues, but they have to do with land use and stuff like that. But that's not a, educational issues. No, you're you're correct. Um, and that was one of the considerations that we uh, uh, were really thinking about because um, climate change, in some respects, is so much harder <laughs> than evolution. Um, the ideological positions are as firmly held. I mean, teachers will tell us that. Um, uh, they'll start talking about CO2 and the students will write it on down. They start talking about the carbon cycle and the students will write it on down. And they talk about how, well, you know, so now there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, so the planet's getting warmer. Teacher, <laughs> my dad says global warming is a, is a liberal um, a plot. So, you know, the ideological fervor is certainly there, but there's nothing that you can do about it legally. It, it's a much harder problem to deal with because you really have to deal with it um, from the grassroots up. You have to have teachers who are knowledgeable and competent and confident and able to deal with student um, objections in a way that eventually brings students around. And part of that is uh, teaching science in ways that are more um, likely to promote um, uh, understanding rather than just memorization, which unfortunately too much science education still is. Um, no, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a tougher issue in a lot of ways. This is going to be the last question. Uh, I have heard people argue that anthropogenic climate change is not possible because only God can change the, such condition of the earth. And uh, that's sort of a religious position, I guess. Yes, that's true. Um, that is, of all the people who object to uh, climate change or who don't accept anthropogenic cli uh, global warming, um, there, is a sli there is a slice who do it for religious reasons. And it basically has to do with providential theology. Uh, the idea that God would never do anything to um, uh, hurt his creation. And it's just human hubris to think that we could do something that would uh, upset the balance of the planet. Uh, you know, God sent the flood, so who are we to think that we can affect things like climate? Um, but when you look at the and we actually have some pretty good survey research for this. And of course, there's some overlap for this. But the major motivator for um, uh, objections to uh, anthropogenic uh, global warming is political and economic. There is, in fact, um, a fairly sizable group of uh, conservative Christians, evangelicals, who are um, green Christians. Uh, they embrace stewardship theology, and their belief is that uh, God sent us here on earth to steward the planet, and we should take good care of God's creation, so let's get all this crap out of the air. So, you know, we hug the same trees, uh, them and me. We don't hug the evolution tree, we just hug, hug the climate change tree. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak in your inaugural meeting. Thank you very much for coming. All right, so... Uh, to anyone else who would like to continue the night, uh, we're, a few of us are going to go over the, to the Tide House uh, over in Mountain View. Uh, well, I guess we are in Mountain View. Um, but uh, yeah, if you'd like to come join us there, we'll be over there shortly. Thank you very much for coming. And can I get one more round of applause for Dr. Scott? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.